This morning, we are going to continue our series on, on grace and truth. And to, to begin, I'd like you to turn to John chapter 1, if you have your Bibles. Uh, John chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 1, uh, verses 14 and verse 16 of John chapter 1. Verse 14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And verse 16, from the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. Well, this morning we're going to take a closer look at truth. Uh, I'd like to begin by asking the question, um, why tell the truth? Why tell the truth? Okay. Thanks, Melvin. Anybody else? Uh, okay. Brings honor to God. You don't feel guilty when you tell the truth. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that's, yeah, thanks, Glenn. Really, I mean, if you tell one lie, then you have to remember that lie because, you, you know, it gets really complicated. So, so why not just tell the truth? We are so used to being lied to that it's hard to discern what's true and what's not true. Uh, some honored historians have plagiarized. Uh, some politicians have invented um, war records. Um, some coaches have embellished their resumes. Uh, sometimes employees call in sick when they plan on playing golf. In one survey, 64% of Americans said this, I will lie when it suits me if it doesn't cause any real damage. Also in that survey, only 31% of Americans agree that honesty is the best policy. Well, I can tell we have more than 31% here in this group. Uh, I think we have a unanimous decision here. But in a general survey, only 31% of the people in the survey um, agreed that honesty is the best policy. And when asked what they would do for $10 million, 25% of them said that they would abandon their family for $10 million. Uh, also for $10 million, 7% said that they would murder a stranger. Unbelievable. You know, there was a time early in our nation's history that we had a moral consensus. Um, not everybody lived by that standard, but they recognized it. In Judges chapter 21, verse 25, it seems prophetic of our times. In those days, Israel had no king, and everyone did as he saw fit. Being truthful is important. Uh, lies are damaging. Uh, lies pile up. Uh, take each lie and multiply it by tens of millions of lies in, in business and school and family and government, and you have monumental moral erosion. It's like bleeding to death from 10,000 paper cuts. Alexander Solzhenitsyn said in his Nobel Prize acceptance address, and I quote, one word of truth outweighs the entire world. End of quote. Uh, what did he mean? He meant 
that the truth is bigger than us. Just as the Berlin Wall finally toppled, the weight of all the world's lies can be toppled by a single truth. You see, truth resonates in the human heart. People may resist it, yet it's the truth they need, for it's the truth that sets them free. Tragically, Christians can be as untruthful as the world. Some Christian colleges pu publish doctrinal statements that some faculty members neither believe nor teach. Some Christian uh, musicians take offerings for needy children, but do not reveal that they retain 20% uh, for themselves. When we fail to tell the truth, we fail to represent Jesus, who is the truth. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. University students, once known as truth seekers, now have minds uh, so open, they don't critically evaluate truth claims. They sit passively while professors teach the random evolution of complex life forms. The professors do not mention uh, the biochemical discoveries that refute Darwinism. They do not mention uh, the biochemical discoveries that provide overwhelming scientific evidence for intelligent design. Less than 100 years ago, on May 25, 1925, John T. Scopes, a young high school teacher in Tennessee, was indicted for teaching Darwin's theory of evolution to students in a science class. Less than 100 years, someone was indicted for teaching Darwinism. And now, we get into trouble if we teach intelligent design or creationism. Do you see where we've come? Do you see where we've gone with the truth? Many professors are not truth seekers, they are gatekeepers who are highly selective about which teachings they will allow in their classrooms. Ellen Bloom said this in the book, The Closing of the American Mind, and I quote, there's one thing a professor can be absolutely certain of, almost every student entering the university believes or says he believes that truth is relative. Now someone might say the really important thing <clears throat> isn't finding the truth, it's the search. Really? I mean, try using that same logic to your search for a job or your search for a flotation device when you are drowning. Now, someone might also say there is no such thing as truth. Well, is that a true statement? That there's no such thing as truth? Apparently, it can be if there is no such thing as truth. Another person might say truth is what you sincerely believe. Truth is whatever you sincerely believe. You know, we can walk off a ledge sincerely believing that we won't fall, but gravity cares nothing about our sincerity. We're not nearly as sincere as we imagine, but even when we are, we are sometimes wrong. Uh, someone else might say, uh, what's true for you is true for you, and what's true for me is true for me. Again, does that mean that if we step off the roof at the same time, I will 
fall because I believe in gravity and you will hover in the air because you don't believe in gravity? Only 22% of adults believe in absolute moral truths. Amazingly, among those who say they know they will go to heaven after they die because they have confessed their sins and accepted Christ as their Savior, only 32% of them believe in absolute moral truths. Theological illiteracy and unbelief have dramatically uh, increased among evangelical Christians in the past few decades. Uh, churches need a fresh infusion of truth because it is the truth that sets us free. John chapter 2 highlights Jesus' first miracle. Uh, wouldn't you expect it to be something earth-shaking? So what did Jesus do for an opener? It turned the water into wine. Why? Well, verse 11 tells us that Jesus revealed his glory and his disciples put their faith in him. Another reason Jesus may have turned the water into wine was so the host could be saved from embarrassment. What Jesus did was a thoughtful act of grace. In contrast, the very next scene shows Jesus making a whip, and he's turning tables over, and he's driving merchants out of the temple courts. He shouts at them, how dare you turn my father's house into a market. Jesus was consumed with his father's righteous standards. He wouldn't tolerate disregard for holiness and truth. What Jesus did in the temple courtyards was a striking affirmation of truth. In John chapter 2, we are given a demonstration of grace, the turning of water into wine, followed by a demonstration of truth, uh, the clearing of the, the temple by Jesus. The ancient historical Jesus came full of grace and truth. The modern uh, mythological Jesus, created by some, comes full of tolerance and relativism. Here's the problem. I guess that's for the last note. Uh, here's the problem. Without truth, we lack courage to speak, and we lack convictions to speak about. Without grace, we lack compassion to meet people's deepest needs. Many American colleges were built with the vision and funding of Christians. Why? To teach truth. Many American hospitals were built with the vision and funding of Christians. Why? To extend grace. We don't have the luxury of choosing either grace or truth. Uh, we must learn to say yes to both grace and truth and to say no to whatever keeps us from them. Well, let's look at the truth about heaven and hell, the Christian life is not based on avoiding the truth, but on hearing the truth and submitting to it. The greatest kindness we can offer each other is the truth. Some have been taught that it's inappropriate to say anything negative, being a good witness once, once meant faithfully representing Christ even when it meant being unpopular. We have redefined what it means to be Christ-like. We have redefined Christ-like to mean nice. 
uh, by, that def- by that definition, Christ wasn't always Christ-like. He confronted people with sin. Um, I think he raised his voice on certain occasions. Uh, he threw tables over. He called people snakes. Um, he called people blind hypocrites and whitewashed tombs. Uh, he called the religious leaders snakes. He called the religious leaders whitewashed tombs and blind hypocrites. If we don't talk about sin and hell because we want to be nice, we are trying to be nicer than Jesus, who spoke a great deal about both sin and hell. The shifting evangelical positions on sin and hell illustrate our failure to reconcile grace and truth. While liberal groups and cults have always denied or redefined hell, evangelicals have consistently held to the biblical teaching that hell is real and eternal until recently. There are some who say they cannot believe in hell because they believe in God's grace. They will say that God loves them too much to send them to hell. It sounds reasonable. It sounds logical. But logic is not our authority. Scripture is our authority. Besides, Apart from God, our, our logic is twisted. This is what Jesus said in Matthew 25. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Now the word eternal shows up twice in that one verse. The same Greek word translated eternal is used of both heaven and and hell. If heaven lasts forever, so does hell. Jesus spoke about hell more than any other person in the Bible. In Matthew 5, 22, Jesus spoke of being in danger of the fire of hell. Then in Matthew 5, 29, he he spoke of being thrown into hell. The false doctrine of having a heaven for everyone and a hell for no one removes the urgency from the gospel. It also keeps people from grace. The denial of hell in the name of grace actually keeps people from seeing their need and experiencing the wonderful grace of Jesus. The one who thinks he is not drowning will not reach out for the life preserver. Why should he? Well, let's look at the real question. The question is not why God would send people to hell. That is not the question. He's infinitely righteous, and we are sinners steeped in rebellion. Send people to hell? It's a no-brainer. I mean, where else would you send them? You see, the real question is, How could a holy God send send sinful men to heaven? We ask the wrong questions because we don't grasp the truth. Therefore, we don't grasp the wonders of his grace. We may imagine that hell is is out of proportion to our offenses, because we don't grasp how serious our offenses really are. God's grace faces hell 
tells reality head on, offering full deliverance, denying the fact that hell exists takes the wind out of grace assails. In fact, if there's no hell, grace is, you might say, meaningless. If there is no eternal hell, the stakes of redemption are vastly reduced. Vastly reduced. What exactly did Jesus die to rescue us from? A rescue is only as dramatic as the fate from which someone is rescued. When people are rescued from the 20th story of a burning building, it's heroic. It's newsworthy. You'll read about it in the paper You'll read about it online, in the news. But if people are simply ushered out of a smoky lobby of some building, where's the heroism? Where's the drama? Grace is God's work to deliver us from the full extent of our sin and its punishment. By underestimating our sin and denying that an eternal hell exists, Satan tries to lower, tries to lower redemption's price tag, cheapening the grace that paid the price. You can see how teaching that hell does not exist can cause people or keep people from coming to Christ. If there's no hell, I guess we don't need a savior. The truth is there is a hell and we desperately need a savior. One out of five women having an abortion in America claims to be a born-again Christian. Uh, pastors sometimes hesitate uh, to speak on abortion because it will make some people feel guilty because uh, uh, those who've had abortions would feel guilty. But isn't that exactly why we should talk about it? To help people, men as well as women, since men are always involved, Shouldn't we talk about it to help people recognize and, and deal with their guilt that they might receive God's grace and find healing and to move on with their lives? Also, shouldn't, shouldn't we talk about it to help others avoid the sin that creates the guilt? Many women have experienced God's forgiveness and, and profound healing after an abortion. The women who suffer the most are the ones who do not face the truth. Deep inside, they know. Their consciences accuse them and they pursue self-destructive behaviors. Instead of finding healing, through Jesus, they destroy themselves. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, tells us to speak the truth in love, not to, it doesn't say to withhold the truth in love. It says speak the truth in love. Our job is not simply to help each other feel good, but to help each other make good choices. At a time when many churches are backing away from truth-telling, secular recovery advocates are embracing truth-telling uh, through intervention with addicts. 
So why do we have this movement towards truth-telling by secular recovery advocates? Simply because it works. It works. The way to no longer feel guilty is not to deny guilt, but, but to face it and ask God's forgiveness. Sometimes showing grace requires silence. Other times it requires speaking up. You know, after coming to Christ in 1975, uh, my wife, Sherida, and I, we spoke to every brother and sister and every parent we had about Christ. We thought that they would be thrilled to hear what had happened to us and, and what could happen. What can happen to them? Some listened, some did not. My father would listen politely, but didn't seem to take what we shared seriously. That was painful. Well, about four years before my dad died, he developed some health problems and was in a great deal of pain, and I wasn't sure how much longer he would live. And I really felt the Holy Spirit prompting me to share with him, again, the gospel, the plan of salvation. And so I drove out to South Dakota to share the gospel with my father. Now, I've spoken to many people about Jesus, but this was the most difficult one of all because this was my dad, the one who brought me up, the one who raised me, the one who taught me right from wrong, and now I'm telling him he's a sinner and he needs Jesus. I was nervous. As I explained the gospel to him, every word was, I wavered through the whole thing. But this time he was open. He was open to the gospel and he listened carefully to what I said. And then he prayed with me to receive Christ. I was terrified. I was terrified to share Christ with my father. Yet to do so was clearly in his best interest. Share the truth and then offer grace and help. I'd like to have the worship team uh, come up at this time. Unfortunately, many non-believers know only two kinds of Christians, uh, uh, those who speak the truth without grace or those who are very nice but never share the truth. What they need to see is a, a third type of Christian, a one who in a spirit of grace uh, loves them enough to tell them the truth. The truth is that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And then in the next verse, John 3, 17, we read that for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So many of us know John 3, 16, but we need to also remember John 3, 17. God did not send his son here to this planet to condemn the world, but to save it. Of course, those who are saved are those who place their trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. You know, God is in a saving mode. God is in a saving mode. How do I know? Well, he sent his son. He sent his son.